So um, thank you for Brian and John for inviting me to talk today and thank you all for coming for so early after a late dinner last night. Um, so today I'm going to reflect back on the metadata associated with entries in the CSD and some of this will touch on some of the points that Simon made in the previous talk. I'm going to look at some of the recent metadata initiatives, some of the challenges we have faced and some of the challenges we still face. So um, I think as Herb said yesterday, not all metadata comes from a single source. So if we think about a single crystal structure, then we have metadata associated with the crystal itself. So we have um, data about the synthesis of the crystal, the crystallization conditions of the crystal, maybe some physical properties of the crystal, like melting point solubility. Then there's data about the defect experiment itself, so um, the instrumentation used, the conditions, etc. And then we have the raw data, the process data, and the derived data, and in some cases an associated publication. And we use some of this data to create a CSD entry, and I think what was said a couple of times yesterday is what we're really aiming to do is go from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. So historically at the um, CCDC, our emphasis has been on the deposition of derived data. So typically um, what we collect or what we receive from depositors is the um, electronic SIF file and this contains atomic coordinates. And we use those coordinates to create an entry in the CSD that has chemical connectivity, TD diagram and more chemical information such as compound name. And over the 50 years when we've been creating the CSD, the number of crystal structures or small molecule crystal structures published has continued to rise. So we've now got over 790,000 crystal structures in the CSD. And just as the PDB, as the number of structures in the database rises, the complexity and size of the structures also continues to rise. So we've really had to evolve the ways we deal with data and metadata at CCDC. So I'm going to take a step back and reflect um, the types of metadata associated with a CSD entry. Um, and so my simplistic view of metadata is that it's a set of data that describes and gives information about other data. And the data that I'm going to focus on this morning is data that describes the substance studied, and this is important for discovery, analysis, and mining of the data. Data that describes the data set as a whole, and this is important for provenance and attribution of the data. And then data that describes the experiment, so things like where it was done, how it was done, who did it, and who funded it. And when I go through those categories, I'm going to look at some of the recent initiatives that we've had at CCDC, some of the changes we've made, and some of the challenges we still face. So as you all know, back in the 1990s, the crystallographic information framework was launched under the guidance of the IUCR, and this was widely and extensively adopted by both the crystallographic community and the publishing community. And this allows um, people to store derived results, raw and processed data, experimental conditions and publication data. And we can see that it's really revolutionised how small molecule crystal structures were published. So pre-SIF, um, when a crystal structure was published, the publication would include hand-typed tables of coordinates, and we used to have to use those hand-typed coordinates to create an entry in the CSD. Thankfully, now things are different. So you can see here the rise of crystal structures, and then the rise of um, the deposits that are electronic SIFs, and so virtually all of the new depositions are now electronic SIFs. Um, because we have a standard way of people depositing data, that's allowed us to create an interactive web deposition process. And following the IUCR's lead, we're strongly encouraging the deposition of structure factors alongside SIF. Um, and we're working with the IUCR, with the community and with publishers to um, make this mandatory in the future. We can also check uh, the data that's being deposited. So we've got syntax checking during the deposition process. And just last month, um, we've been collaborating with the IUCR to integrate um, the IUCR's CheckSIF service into the process as well. So depositors can check the integrity of their data. And I think this is really important, both for the depositor, for the crystallographic community, and for the publishers. 
During the deposition process, we also highlight some key metadata that is used to create a CSD entry to the depositor. So metadata is pulled out and extracted from the SIF, and it's things like compound name, colour, habit, um, and melting point. And the depositor is asked to review their data and enhance their data. But I think we all know that sometimes um, allowing free text and allowing people to enter data manually is not a good thing um, and is not always the right thing to do. So, and I think it's important to try and capture metadata in as semantic or defined way as possible. So if we look at things like colours reported in the CSD, we see colours such as wine-coloured crystals, but there's no information about what coloured wine people are actually talking about. And if we look at morphologies, we often get um, different descriptions of the same shape. So we've got penguin-shaped crystals, we've got pear-shaped crystals, we've got lozenge-shaped crystals. So perhaps there should be some more defined um, dictionary of what should be allowed in certain metadata fields. Sometimes it's hard to know what the metadata is actually referring to as well. So if we look at morphology again, um, sometimes we don't know whether the crystallographer is reporting the morphology of the growing crystal or the crystal as it was cut and put on the diffractometer. I think manually entering information also means that sometimes the depositor doesn't always get things right. So when we look at SIFs deposited at CCDC, in some cases, we see that the melting point is actually lower than the study temperature of the diffraction experiment. And when we looked at this further, we saw that it was predominantly due to people putting in the melting point of their crystal in Celsius and not Kelvin, so the wrong units. So I think it's really important, and I think this echoes some of what Simon said, to try and capture the metadata directly from the equipment um, in a standard a way as possible. Maybe have some defined dictionaries to use for certain metadata and to increase the validation of the metadata that um, can be done. So maybe validating things like um, showing what the probable colours are or improbable colours are for a crystal based on the chemistry of the um, structure and most um, improbable melting points highlighted. So to deal with all of the deposited data and the metadata and the increasing volume of data that we receive at CCBC, um, we launched a new infrastructure um, in 2013 called CSD Expedite. And this tries to automate as much of the process as we can while keeping some of the manual parts of the process where our scientific input really adds value. So the boxes in green here are the automated parts of the process and you can see it's quite a linear um, workflow. This new system is based on Microsoft Dynamics CRM and it's used to manage all of the transactions and interactions that go on behind the scenes. So it's not just the CSD entries that we have to deal with. So in um, the new system there are a number of different entities or record types and each entity has its own metadata associated with it. So we've got an entity for things like the deposit, um, the CSD entry, publication, journal, publishers, and there really is quite a lot of information to manage. One of the key things we do when creating the CSD is to add chemistry to the coordinates. And we do this using an um, automated process in the first instance and software that we've developed at CCDC called Decipher. And this uses a probability probabilistic approach. So it looks at all of the 750,000 structures in the CSD and uses Bayesian theorem to work out what the most probable chemistry and um, chemical connectivity is from the coordinates. It, the chemistry and co uh, chemical connectivity then gets assigned a reliability score so we know how good the chemical um, assignment might be. And then each entry is checked manually by our editors. And I think the assignment of chemistry is really important to allow users to discover data, do data mining, analysis, and allow us to do interoperability of the structures. So as well as data about um, the crystallographic information, like the cell parameters, assigning the chemical connectivity allows us to add things like compound names, chemical diagrams, and this is really useful when people are doing searches and analysis of the data. So let's go on to look at the um, data that describes the data set as a whole. And I think this is important for provenance and attribution of the data. 
So this includes publication data, so when the data was published, who published it, and where it was published. And this could be scientific literature, or it could be private communication in the CSD, or it could be things like a university repository, so e-crystals like um, Simon mentioned. And then we could also think um, a bit further and think about authorship data. So instead of just who published um, the corresponding publication, who created the sample, who did the data collection, and who performed the data analysis. And we have quite a lot of complicated workflows in place to allow us to associate CSD data with publication data. And we have workflows in place with all the major publishers that let us know when data is included in a manuscript, when it goes to just accepted or ASAP stage, and when it's then fully published. We also have um, interactions with third-party services such as Crossref, so we can find automated ways of from some of the publication information, finding out what the DOI of the publication is, or vice versa. And all of these complicated workflows and interactions allow us to make the data available to the right people at the right time. So the data is available, both the deposited data and the most probable chemistry um, and chemical assignment um, at the point of refereeing. So referees and publishers during the peer review process can obtain data from the CCDC. And then the data is available immediately when um, a structure is published in a publication. And uh, links are in place from the publications to the data that's stored at CCDC for publishers such as the ACS, RSC, Elsevier, Wiley, and the IUCR. When we think about publications, we've also been thinking about data um, and data publications. And we've started assigning a data set DOIs to CSD entries. We started last year, and we've assigned over 500,000 DOIs. And DOIs are now assigned within an hour of publication. And I think this really forms a foundation for formalizing um, data citation and interoperability. So if we think about a typical publication, we have a list of authors. And the list of authors might not necessarily include the crystallographer, so they don't always get credit for their contribution. The DOI associated with an article doesn't identify the data, it identifies the paper. And sometimes if the um, CIF file is uploaded with the publication, it can be buried away in supporting information. So I think assigning DOIs um, helps pave the way, and what we've also done is on our Get Structures service, so where people come and get data from us, we've got a CCDC citation box. And at the moment, this mirrors publication information, but in the future, we could see this becoming more of the um, details about who created the data itself. When people download data from CCDC, we also add some key metadata into the downloaded file. So we add things like the um, CSD DOI, so people can get access to more information, um, the publication information, and when it was deposited and downloaded. Assigning DOIs means that we can link to other services as well and facilitate interoperability. So in minting a DOI with data sites, we have to provide data site with some key metadata. And people like Thomson Reuters and the Data Citation Index can then pick up this um, metadata and create CSD entries in other services such as the Data Citation Index. So now the Data Citation Index also covers um, crystal structures. Um, as um, Simon touched on earlier, we're also working with a number of other um, projects, um, and Ian Bruno in particular has been working heavily with JISC and the RDA. And you can see here one of the out recent outputs from the RDA, which is the Data Literature Interlinking Service, which ingests um, data article links. And you can go onto their beta service, and here are some of the graphics and um, information that you can find out, so about data sets and publications and how they link together. Because we assign um, chemical connectivity to structures in the CSD, we can also link to other resources and other metadata, um, and we can do this based on the chemistry. So we've been working hard to assign reliable um, inches to a subset of our structures in the um, CSD, 
and we've added links to CSD entries to more general repositories such as ChemSpider. So you can see there's a link and the user can also visualize the crystal structure. So they can see crystal structure data alongside things like NMR data, IR data, and wider context data. Um, and in the next day or two, we'll also be adding links to PubChem, and that should go live very soon. As well as more general chemistry, we can also um, link between crystallographic databases. So um, we've been working with the PDB to match PDB ligands to best representative CSD molecules. And of the 20,000 um, chemical components in the PDB uh, chemical component dictionary, there are about 1,500 exact matches for structures in the CSD. And PDB users can now link between the two. Um, so a second call out for Brian's talk next, and I think he's going to mention ICAS in, the, in that talk, is an investigation that we did um, last year about trying to link between the raw data stored at STFC and the model structure stored at CCDC. So we looked at um, publication DOIs in the um, two systems and see if we could match the data, and we also looked at some of the metadata contained in the SIF. Um, I think we could find some matches, but I think we need to have a more systematic approach to match raw data and model structures in the future. So when we talk about publications and DOIs, assigning DOIs also means that researchers can add data to their researcher IDs, such as ORCID, alongside their publication. So they're getting more um, attribution um, and credit for their data as well as publication. We might also want to think about how we could um, add data about funders, um, about grant numbers, and associate that with data and publications. And then about institutions, so working with people like ISNI and Ringgold to associate data and institutions as well. So some of the immediate things that we're working on in the area of metadata is the creation of a new CSD deposition portal to allow depositors to log on, see the data, edit the data, um, and enhance the data um, ready to create a CSD entry, and extend some of the integrity checks involved in that um, deposition process. We're also looking at extending the linking between different data sets. Um, and extending the programmatic access to data. So earlier this year, we launched um, our CSD Python API, and this gives users of the CSD programmatic access to the data in the CSD entry. And we're looking to extend that to more data and more of the deposited data, making more of the deposited data available in a um, programmatic way. We're also looking to extend the data available to the wider community. So we've got a free service on our website where people can access um, crystal structure data. And we're extending the search functionality and including the addition of inches into this. And we're trying to make the data more accessible to um, a broader audience. So present it in a way that non-crystallographers could understand. So that was a brief roundup of some of the things that we've been in, involved with. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time, and if there's any questions, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Susanna. So did I understand that one of the requirements uh, from CCDC is that COMSIFs um, should add uh, the specification of penguin-shaped crystal to its, uh, to its dictionary. <laughs> we can't take that out. <laughs> Hi, it's Mike Provo of Newcastle. Um, given the ambiguity over some of crystal shapes and colors and things, mm -hmm. is there not an argument for actually storing images of crystals? Yes. Alongside the, the deposited data? Yeah. So that leads on to a second thing, which possibly falls for the next two speakers as well. Um, if um, can you envisage a situation where the, the, the CCDC is acting as a repository for raw diffraction data, having already stated that you're trying to move to a situation where it's a requirement for structure factors to be deposited, yeah. or would that cause a data avalanche that the company couldn't deal with? 
Um, and the reason it could be more pertinent to the next two speakers is that possibly the amount of data that's collected in home sources compared to the amount of data that's collected per day at central facilities would mean that this could be something that's handled by the central facilities only. Yeah. I think we'd have to think very carefully if we started handling raw data and how it would reflect or how it would um, change our sustainability model. So at the moment we've got processes in place where we can deal with the amount of data and uh, we've kind of future-proofed it as much as we can. But as soon as we start talking about a lot of data, then I think that would change and it would change um, how we would need to charge for some of our services. So I think we're very keen to support initiatives like this and try and link to as much data as we can and have linking between data. <coughs> Yeah, just to follow up on that, I think the PDB solution of um, allowing for uh, a, a, an entry for DOIs for the raw data yeah. um, is, is the way to yeah. go, rather than imagining that you would host yeah. uh, raw data sets. And I think particularly for the chemical crystallography, where uh, my experience in Manchester was that probably 97% of the data was measured locally and maybe 3% of the projects went off to the uh, central facilities. Um, the university uh, repository is then the outlet for raw data sets and the DOIs. Um, so that, as I say, the whole process of, of simpler for you anyway is to yeah. make yeah. allowance for the DOI to yeah, the which is something that we would definitely do. Okay, thank you. And uh, just to follow up on that point, I mean, the, the DDDWG has been interested in the possibility of individual repositories that collect all of diffraction data. Um, there's an economic case to be considered. Um, uh, people very often say, well, these days storage is cheap. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not so much the bulk storage that is costly, but the organization yeah. that allows you to make good use of that. And characterizing you know, the metadata framework, that would make um, the costs come down to those of the bulk storage part of the exercise that we're engaged in. Uh, two or three years ago, when I look in the differences be between Cambridge Database and ACTA E, I believe, ACTA E collected experimental details. Mm -hmm. And I remember that Colin told me at some point that you are planning to have some experimental details. I think we're planning to extend the metadata um, that's available through the CSD. And the but we need to make sure that's next, captured in the right way. Next world. question, how <laughs> many uh, structures which you have were never published? Um, so we're, we've got an initiative on that at the moment and we've looked in our repository and we've got about 120,000 crystal structures in the repository that have never been published. So we're going back and contacting the depositors and putting automated workflows in place to allow us to publish those. We've also changed um, the embargo period on our deposition process to a year to try and get that feedback loop um, shorter. Um, so people haven't moved on by the time um, and, we contact them. And um, you see, sometimes I w wonder how many structures are not going to Cambridge yeah. database. Yeah. They are not going anywhere. So I think because I know people who are doing 600 structures yeah. a year. Yeah. So. Um, I worked out for a recent talk that it could be about 15-20% of structures that actually get deposited at CCDC. Whether that's um, true or not, I'm just being optimistic, I don't know. But I think it, we need to make sure that we're part of the crystallographer's workflow, that there's no barrier for deposition and it's just part of the process. <coughs> Coming to you back to Lance Florence. And considering that you can have, uh, using the same raw data, you can have different structure interpretation. Yeah. Like um, mm, you can mis, uh, misinterpret symmetry or um, miss twinning or satellite reflections. Yeah. Um, can you consider of introducing the, the pure descriptor, the same raw data, uh, have different 
in entries in the CCDC uh, based on the same on the, on the same data collection. Um, yep. Um, at the moment, we allow reinterpretations of the same data, and we allow um, redeterminations of the same structure, and we link between those, and we have what's called ref code families between the structures. But I do think we need to go further. Um. So thank you very much indeed, Susanna. Thank you.